Good evening and welcome to the Holland Lifelong Learning at the South Carolina Aquarium. This series is sponsored by Mary and Mason Holland and Christopher Cocker of Ameriprise Financial. And tonight we do have Kendall back here at our information desk um, talking about memberships. If you have any questions, you can stop by her and maybe get some swag. But I hope you all are ready for tonight's topic. I'm so excited. It doesn't stink. So drag your stool a little closer as we talk about scat, the scientific word for animal poop, waste, droppings, excrement, or whatever word you may use. It is my duty to introduce our speaker for this evening. Christina Wheeler holds the role of a natural history interpretation speci specialist for the Charleston County Parks and Recreation Commission. She has been working professionally as a naturalist along the Eastern Seaboard for over 20 years. From the low country of South Carolina down to Belize, Central America. Christina is an American Canoe Association level two coastal kayak instructor. She's a Charleston master master naturalist and certified interpretive guide with the National Association of Interpretation. In her spare time, Christina loves to travel to new places to go camping, mountain biking, hiking, and paddling. Please welcome Christina Wheeler. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I am extremely excited. Um, once again, my name is Christina Wheeler, Natural History Interpretation Specialist for the Charleston County Park and Recreation Commission. That is a big, long job title that I like to shorten to naturalist. And I think our one of our famous statewide naturalists, Mr. Rudy Mankey, says it best. Those that are naturalists are those that stand in awe of nature. And that is all things in nature, including our subject matter tonight. So I feel very thankful to be here. I've worked with the county parks for over 10 years now and have worked as a naturalist in the Charleston area for over 20. And I see several familiar faces and also some new friends. So I'm really excited to um, talk to you all this evening. Thank you so much to the aquarium for having me and to the virtual audience as well. It's great to have you virtually. Thank you. All right, so let's just start out by defining scat. And let's consider that the English language can be complicated. There are words that have multiple meanings. And scat, when I started to do a little bit more research on this topic, I learned there are several different meanings for the word scat. So our first, you know, obvious definition is a noun, that is an animal fecal dropping. I put the little picture, the icon of the human there, because I just want to remind us that we are animals within the animal kingdom as human beings, right? I was super surprised to learn that scat is also a noun for jazz singing with nonsense syllables. Ella Fitzgerald may come to some of your minds. She is the queen of scat singing. Anybody in the audience ever heard of this noun of scat? Familiar? Anybody ever practiced with scatting musically? Yeah? <laughs> Would you come up here for a minute and help me scat? Please? I love it. Please? Do you mind? Yeah, come on up. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I brought something with me that might help. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? This is great. I had no idea that we had a, 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 a scatter. <laughs> I just happened to have a jazz instrument in case there was nonsensical jazz syllable -ing going on. How convenient. This is like, this is excellent. So, uh, 
do 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 it starts with an s it ends with a t it comes out of you and it comes out of me i know what you're thinking but don't call it that let's be scientific and call it scat it's, it's scat, scat. Find it on the ground. It's usually colored brown. It's uh, shaped in a mound. It's it's scat. scat. <laughs> Is it scat? <laughs> it's scat. It's scat. I lost my place on the jazz instrument. That's all right. It sounds good to me. A little break. I'm going the opposite way. Not like scat. It only goes down. You can smell it on your nose. It's gonna decompose. It's where the fungus grows. Scat. scat. Let's get the audience involved. Everybody, a little, a little clapping. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I can do it better now. Birds flying through the air. Look out. Beware. You got some in your hair. It's scat. <laughs> I was hiking through the fog when I saw a big log. It came out of a dog. It's scat. <laughs> I know it's kind of gory. It marks territory. And it's a uh, true story. It's, it's scat. scat. <laughs> yeah, squirrel ate a nut. It came out of its butt. And it digested in its gut. It's scat. scat. Yes. All right. And to the last definition of scat, I'm going to ask Thomas to scat away because as a verb, it means to go away quickly. Thank you, Thomas, for the amazing jazz singing and for teaching us all a little bit about jazz scat. And I'd like to give credit originally to the Banana Slug String Band. Maybe some of you are aware. I know we have several educators in the audience and also virtually as well, but the Banana Strug, Slug String Band does some incredible education material. So please look them up. I actually peeked at them on Spotify earlier and I was very impressed at their, their discography history. It's amazing. So definitely worth a look up. All right, excellent. So how did I get here? How am I here to teach all of you fine folks about SCAT tonight? Um, I have a long series of photos that look a lot like this. Um, this photo was taken um, in New Brunswick, Canada on a paper company road. There is probably two dozen photos of me like this in very remote locations, including beaver dams when my parents paddled away the canoe and left and then took a picture of me from afar. Um, so I usually was jealous of my friends that were getting to go to Disney World and doing all these fun trips. And I thought I was being tortured when I was dragged to the middle of nowhere to go camping and stare at trees and learn about birds. And I realized now that I was very fortunate to have that childhood and really lucky to experience the outdoors from a very young age so that I became very comfortable with the outdoors and really connected with it. Um, I'm sure at this point, I probably wasn't so thrilled. But um, anyway, we always look for the brown signs, especially the ones with the tents and especially the ones with the picnic tables. And am thankful for that background that kind of set me on the track to really just being a lifelong naturalist. Um, my maiden name is up there. Some of you may not know that. Um, and then because I want this to be somewhat scientific, any time that I include an animal in this presentation, as myself as a human animal, I'll put the Latin name in there. Because sometimes we forget that Latin is a little bit more available to us than we may realize. It's not a dead language in natural history. That's for sure. It's actually one of the only universal languages. Um, we are, I'm Homo, that is my genus. Sapien is my species name, Homo sapien. Many of us think, oh, I don't know much Latin, but we become fairly obsessed with dinosaurs, I think, fairly early on as kids in life. Tyrannosaurus rex is one of the first things we learn, right? That's a dinosaur. That's the genus and the species. And that's a pretty complicated word, two words to, well, Tyrannosaurus, but it's, it, it's interesting that we sometimes forget that coming from where we've come from. So just want to credit my parents too. Hopefully they're watching virtually because they really set a foundation for me to be very comfortable outdoors and be very interested in natural history. 
everybody poops, right? There's tons of books written on the subject. Um, it is an essential bodily function, and it can offer a huge amount of information about general health, diet, and genetics even. Scientists study it to learn about the hidden lives of animals. It's a fun science that really truly does make the world go round. In this short presentation tonight, I've really chosen to focus on the animal world outside of the human world. So maybe there'll be a future talk with it's more human based, but most of my presentation really focuses on animals in the wild and the scat that's related um, there. And it is, it's, it's a science that keeps on giving, right? There's endless information um, when it comes to scat. So we can let it help enhance our sense of wonder about all the different natural processes that we encounter in life. So clues in the poo. Scat is often intentionally placed by animals to mark territory. And we'll go into a few examples in a little bit, but pretty fascinating when you start to research and learn that they even use scent posts at trail junctions. There's several animals that will even leave marks and clues to other animals so that they understand where the animal is heading. And then there can even be information about health and genetics and fertility information. So just by leaving a scent marker, an animal may know that another animal is available to mate and it might be worthwhile to track that animal and follow that animal. So even fertility information, pretty fascinating. It can also help narrow down food availability to wildlife. As habitat loss continues to be an issue and natural plants, native species tend to be declining to some extent, it's always really good to understand like what types of food are available to the wildlife that's around us. And going through SCAT can actually really help you figure these things out. And then it can also help determine what type of animal that you are tracking if you're really interested. And it's in our fairly recent ancestry that we had to be trackers to survive, right? Just to simply survive, whether we're hunting an animal because we need to feed ourselves or whether we're being hunted by an animal and need to understand what that animal's doing. It's really in our recent kind of history to have this in ourselves, have this in our ancestry to kind of have that desire for tracking it becomes like a big scavenger hunt. And the more that you learn about it, the more fun it becomes to kind of unravel the mysteries and the stories. Um, so critters may leave scat out in the open in, a, in an open location as if saying, hey, this is my space. Stay away from here. Um, it might help a fox when it's returning home. It might try to find its scent and smell and go, oh yeah, this is my scat. So I need to go this way to get back to my home. So there's so much information that can be gained from the clues in the poo. All right, sample time. Did everybody have dinner already? Or are you just holding off for later? Because this is going to get you excited. Um, actually, I had a friend. I'm going to credit this. This is pretty fun, but friend bought me a nice um, bag of chocolate covered peanuts here and a nice, nice clean doo-doo bag. But I thought that was a, a neat little, neat little present. Thank you, Tish. Um, so I have some samples and I'd like to credit Acorn Naturalists. Once again, for our educators in the audience, um, if you haven't ever opened up or looked online at Acorn Naturalists, it is an incredible um, offering for all types of education materials. So for folks like us that might actually want to work with SCAT replicas, and I'll be passing these around for folks to see. Um, and Laura, I'll, I'll help, have your help here if you don't mind. So the first one I'm going to pass around and maybe we could show it up close to the virtual audience. I'm not sure how, if that will work pretty well, um, is white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer, Otocoilus virginianus, they tend to leave in piles, poop in their piles, in brown-shaped uh, pellets, basically, is what they're called. And lagomorphs, that's just a fun science word for rabbits, they also produce pellets, and they produce many of them. Um, think about chocolate-covered raisins, and that's pretty much what you've got. So you come across the trail, and you find these pellets, and they're kind of dark in color, looking a little bit like raisins, and you are likely encountering a white-tailed deer or possibly a rabbit. And there's shapes and sizes that you can get into to even further tell. 
Um, the next sample I have is red fox, Volpe's Volpe's. And the red fox, it's the poop is only about two to three inches long. It's got pointy ends. When you start to study poop, you realize things that you need to look at, like are there pointed ends or there blunt ends? Um, and the red fox happens to have pointy ends. So the next one is a bobcat. I am fortunate enough to come across this scat quite often at Cock Interpretive Center. Now, Cock Interpretive Center has roughly a thousand acres and it's, it's treated as a low impact wildlife preserve. It's fairly different than some of the other county parks in that we don't allow dogs or bicycles and that there's a lot of land there to really support what I like to call the charismatic megafauna. So the animals that are like the, the river otters, the bobcats, the, you know, just really creatures that we don't tend to see as often in Charleston County anymore. So it's, it's really cool. I come across bobcats got a fair amount and anybody that cleans up their cat litter boxes definitely knows what cat poop looks like. So it's really often segmented, it's rope-like and it's typically filled with hair and bones. There's some more clues there. So just what the material that's left behind, that undigested material that comes through can tell us a lot about what that animal has eaten. And of course, our bobcats are eating a lot of small mammals. So you tend to find that hair and bone in there. The last cat is probably the most common that I see, and this is raccoon. So thank you so much for carrying on my samples, Laura. Um, so raccoon, Procy Procyon lotar. Droppings are pretty dark in color. They do smell bad and they often contain undigested items. So there's a lot to unpack, I think, there in that. And with any scat investigation, um, you certainly want to be careful. Um, you want to do it mindfully. Um, the naturalist with the stick, it's like our magic wand the long stick. We use sticks for a lot of things. We poke at things with sticks all the time. Um, but if I'm going to look through some scat, I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to approach it with generally something long to kind of look through it and not get up close. And the reason why I mentioned this with raccoons specifically is they can carry ringworm. So that is something that can, roundworm, sorry, roundworm, I believe, um, the parasite. Yes, roundworm. Thank you, Dara. Double correct me on that. Um, so you, you just don't want to necessarily go full on into these things and work with them without using gloves, without, you know, we often have masks on hand now. So it's even a good idea to maybe put on a mask if you're going to look through these things, but to, to do it mindfully and understand that um, there could be some things that we might not want to get too close with. And the dung of other animals isn't really as discomforting as talking about our own. It really is packed with nuggets of interest. Um, and variable diets affect the appearance of feces. Um, so this was kind of cool. When I was researching for this, I learned that even um, scat can tell us things like dominance and hierarchies within wildlife populations. So take a, a pack of coyotes the dominant and most strong alpha coyote in the pack will eat first. And what do they choose to eat first? They choose to eat internal organs. Those are generally the most rich and satisfying nutrient packed. And often the scat that comes out from an animal that's eaten such things is going to be kind of darker, kind of soft. And then the animals that are less dominant, the ones that are lower on the totem pole, they will end up getting more of the stuff that isn't as desirable. So they might end up eating a lot more of the hide and the bone and the, you know, just parts that aren't as good from the animal. So their scat will obviously be different when it comes out, even if they've eaten the same type of source. So it, it really is fascinating when you think about learning things about dominance and hierarchy within wildlife populations just through the scat that's available. So who's poo? This was a fun picture that was taken just within the last month, and it doesn't show it too well, but there were a couple exciting things about this day. This was a beach program at Beach Walker County Park. Hopefully many of you have been there. It's a beautiful place. And this was the day that we got a little bit of snow. So this was a Saturday that we had some snow flurries. Not everybody saw them, but there's a few little tiny little bits of snow in this picture, and I know it's not really that easy to see. 
Um, but what's a little bit more obvious is the, my program participant's hand that's in the back, just to give a little size perspective. When you take a picture of poop, you generally want a ruler. And you'll see most of my pictures, I carry a little plastic ruler in my pack because it just helps give that size perspective. A penny or a pen or something like that can also help, but it's always good to have the size perspective. So this dropping was left in a very prominent location right on the boardwalk at the entrance to the you know, boardwalk going down to Beachwalker. And it was pretty obvious it had been stepped on a little bit. So it's kind of mushed down. But what I really noticed was the amount of undigested material in there and the seeds that were in there. And to me, they looked quite a bit like um, Smilax or um, palmetto seeds, palmetto, uh, dwarf palmetto seeds. And raccoons love to eat things like this. And it tends to pass through them rather quickly. And then you get this undigested seed that's gotten macerated a bit. So it's actually even sometimes really beneficial for the seeds to pass through the digestive system of an animal because it makes them actually more likely to germinate in some cases. But we'll talk a little bit more about seed dispersal in a minute. The real big question is who's poo? Who is it? Which animal? And it is the Northern raccoon. So really wonderful masked bandit. We don't always see these animals because a lot of these species are nocturnal. So this is yet another cool thing about studying the scat of these animals is that you can learn about what animals are in your own area when you're not up and awake, right? You might be sleeping when these animals are busy doing their doing their things. Um, so it's it's really kind of kind of cool to to put together those stories. And these are all mysteries, right? It's all dramas. There's all this stuff going on. It's just whether or not we are interested enough to learn the stories and to look a little bit more deeply and understand the connections. Really exciting. So seed dispersal. This is a really big part of this. Um, Allicory is the term, the science term. Um, Allicory relies on the survival of seed ingesting animals within an ecosystem. So I was just noticing in my own yard, I have pokeweed. It just came up out of nowhere. You know who planted it? Not me, the birds, the birds planted it. Um, I have several spots in my yard where I've created no mow areas. And these are areas that nature is just being nature. And it's been so exciting to see the cool species that are coming up that generally the birds are planting because they're sitting in the treetops high up. They're pooping out these seeds in nice little fertilizer rich packages. And then I get lucky with getting to choose whether I want to keep those certain things in my no mow area. But pokeweed in particular has seeds that really only are truly dispersed by the birds that eat them. And the, um, one of the coolest examples is a cassowary. Now, I have not been lucky enough to travel to Australia, um, but there is a family of birds called cassowaries that are just incredible, incredible birds. And they are essentially planting their own forests for the future. Um, they have a fairly simple gut system. So when they ingest seeds and they eat so many different types of seeds, it goes through their digestive system rather quickly. It takes off a lot of the pulp and the, the fruity material that gives them the nutrients they need, but then it passes out rather quick. And then you've got this seed that has, once again, it's in a nice little fertilizer package and it's, it's gotten macerated a bit so that it has the ability to maybe germinate a bit quicker. And it's been noted that they actually will plant over 238 different species. And that is fascinating. Um, really cool story about some volunteers and a lab that's actually taking cassowary poop and then they're, they're taking the seeds out of it and they're basically planting cassowary corridors. Because as we're learning about habitat fragmentation, what we're learning is that even within our own spaces, we can create wildlife corridors that can greatly help these animals still move about even with our fragmentation. But as long as they have you know, the right plants and the right corridors to travel that are somewhat safe and protected, they will do a lot better. So these volunteers are creating these cassowary corridors by literally using the poop, 
that they're taking the seeds from and then creating them and growing them in a nursery. And it's a really fascinating story of, you know, connectivity between several different species and especially the plants that they rely on. Pretty fascinating. So defecation station. I had to talk about river otters for a minute because I feel like I come across their poop a fair amount. It's somewhat noticeable because they love to eat crustaceans. So they tend to have a lot of, um, a lot of you know, just that crustacean material that's left behind in their poop. They also are like many animals, they have raccoons included, um, they have latrines. So they have particular areas that they use because they're tidy, they're not just gonna go anywhere. Um, they're going to use a certain spot that is their latrine location. So you'll find several, you know, weeks, months, maybe years even worth of scat at all different, you know, ages and, and levels. And once again, that can also be that, that area that a lot of messages are passed, you know, through wildlife, you know, that, that information about the health and the fertility and those types of things. For river otters, scent marking is really imperative for intergroup communication. And that's fascinating. And it's hard for us to sometimes relate to this information because we're humans, we're dominant with our eyesight, right? We're so big, we're so eyesight dominated. And we don't always really think our sense of smell compared to the rest of the animal kingdom is really not that great. So it's sometimes I think hard for us to like understand some of these things because it's, it's hard for us to maybe put ourselves in these situations. Um, but musk from scent glands of river otters can also be secreted when they're frightened or angry. Who knew? Pretty interesting. So these defecation stations can tell us a lot about one animal in particular or that collection and that communication among interspecies groups or within the species themselves. Pretty amazing. All right, bird poo, it's a bit different. It's like a one-stop shop. So bird poo, pretty much, we're going to, ornithologists prefer to call them droppings. They're a little bit different than just poo, they're droppings. Um, but you've got, you've got everything kind of in one, one situation. So there's a cloaca, and that is the passage that excretes both urine and feces. Um, another difference is that mammals excrete the end product urea into their feces, but birds actually convert that urea into uric acid. That's really cool. It's known as guanine. And when a bird expels that substance that has the dark poo usually in the middle with the white urine around it, and that's when you get the splat on your car, hopefully not in your hair. Um, so thinking about bird poo, my favorite story about bird droppings rather is the black vulture. Such a fan of the black vulture. Um, many of you may be taking part in Southeastern Wildlife Exposition activities this weekend. Um, if you hadn't thought about it, maybe take part in the flight demonstration that the Center for Birds of Prey offers in Marion Square. Maybe look up on the schedule, but they offer usually two to three flight demonstrations in Marion Square. It's a lot of fun to watch them fly these wild birds. And they have black vultures I'm not sure if they'll be on show this weekend, but I've spent several several different trips actually times seeing these guys in action. And they're very comfortable on the ground, right? Vultures nest on the ground. And they're actually really entertaining to watch kind of run around and they are pretty amazing birds. I think we tend to think and look at vultures and go, oh, I don't know about them. Um, but they are literally helping keep our planet clean. They really are nature's recyclers. They're incredible birds. But more of what I wanted to point out, and I'm glad humans don't do this, but they have something that's called urohydrosis, which is a process that keeps them cool. And it's by defecating on their legs. Ah, fun. Um, so when you look at the black vulture and you look at their kind of their skin tone, it's, it is black, it's very dark and their legs are actually black too, but they don't ever appear that way because they actually defecate on their legs and the liquid portion of that uric acid as it evaporates, it helps cool blood vessels in their unfeathered tarsi and feet. And so that's why their legs, as you can kind of see in the picture here, are appearing almost like completely white. And I think that's pretty cool. Amazing, the black vultures. Turkey vultures also do this too. Um, these are the two species of vulture that you would come across in coastal South Carolina. 
And next time you see a vulture, I recently was told that they, a gentleman referred to vultures as sky lords. And I love that term. So every time I see a vulture now, I instantly think sky lord. And I'm pretty impressed by them all the time. But amazing. Okay. Couldn't talk about dung without mentioning the dung beetle. So dung beetles are incredible. Beetles in general are amazing. Beetles are in the order Coleoptera. So we refer to them um, as coleopterans. And these species, there's about 8,000 described species and many more to describe. I can guarantee that. Um, there are, I, I didn't put a species specific. I put the super family that they belong in and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that. Um, so you can try it. The three different types of dung beetles are rollers, tunnelers or dwellers. I thought this was really cool because I thought they just all rolled their poop around. I didn't realize that there are some that actually tunnel, like they find a great stash of poop and then they tunnel below that poop. And then they kind of just live their lives being underneath and, and kind of working with it. And then there are dwellers that kind of live around the poop. And then of course, I think the famous roller. Um, and I heard about this a long time ago and I just love the thought of it, but there's a nocturnal African dung beetle that is one of the few known non-vertebrate animals that actually navigates using the Milky Way. How fascinating is that? It's a dung beetle. Like that's amazing. Absolutely incredible. Um, when this slide first came up, you might have been like, why on earth is she mess up there? There's a picture of her in a truck and that just looks weird. What's going on there? It's because I like to, as a naturalist, try to help people relate to some of the animal feats that occur in nature. And these animals just have incredible strength or hearing or sense of taste, all these different things that we maybe have a hard time relating to. So my relation here is that these heavy lifting beetles can move their dung balls that weigh over 50 times their own weight. Okay. So. That is equal to me standing on my hands and guiding a Ford F-250 truck around with my feet, okay? So you can picture that. I was gonna rotate the picture, but it looked really weird upside down. Um, but yeah, I don't think I could do that even if the truck was on its wheels. But imagine that, 50 times their weight um, is what they're, they're doing and working with. So just incredible. I think we don't really always give animals enough credit. We just need to learn their stories and need to learn that even the, the seemingly, um, uninteresting could be the most interesting thing you've ever learned. It's fascinating. All right. So a little bit back to, um, DNA. Let's talk about that for a minute because extracting DNA from scrap scat is a really great way it's a non-invasive way to study animals. So we can support conservation even of endangered species. I'll actually show an example here in just a minute. But um, DNA from rare Bengal tigers in India has helped scientists actually estimate how many tigers are in the area, where the individuals have been traveling and spending time, and then also really understanding better their genetic relationships, which is incredibly important. One of the main things that happens with um, animals that are in decline and especially endangered species is that you end up with genetic bottleneck and you end up with the lack of genetics to make the population stay healthy and deal with certain diseases and um, pathogens, things that can, can come about. So understanding these relationships and where how many animals and where they are is critically important to this type of conservation work. And to do this without actually capturing the animal is incredibly important. Um, and it's just really that the molecules that are inside the cells of the organisms carry that genetic code, carry that information, and scientists don't actually need to handle the animals to learn about that. I think that's really, really fascinating. So the power in the poo. Um, this was so cool for me to learn, but the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology, I want to introduce you to Tucker in the photo. Um, these are dog sniffers that are literally sniffing out whale poop for science. Incredible. So Tucker is one of 17 dogs that works as a conservation canine. 
and researchers collected 348 whale scats from, well, orcas, from 79 orcas during a seven-year period in Puget Sound. And that's really just the, you know, tucker on the front of the small research boat and going through the Puget Sound and that animal, that, that dog, their sense of smell is incredible. So training them to be able to pick up the scent of that whale poop and makes it a lot easier for them to find it. Um, just amazing, right? Pretty incredible. I just want to include a little bit of the human stuff in here just for a second because I also found this amazing. But um, the there's some Japanese research that claims that dogs can be trained to sniff out bowel cancers, even in the really early diseases, or sorry, early stages of the disease. Incredibly helpful. Um, and also specifically trained Labrador retrievers proved as good at identifying cancers as conventional colonoscopies. So I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about that um, research, but I found that very interesting. And there is a lot more about kind of human related scat and or human, human, human feces and things that we can learn from that as well. Just once again, all going back to that health and the genetics and different, um, you know, populations. Wanted to include a stewardship message. I wouldn't be doing my proper duty to, uh, if I didn't. Um, but the dirty facts. This is this is something that we all should know, and many of us might own dogs. Um, but pet waste is a tough one. Might be a little hard to see this up here, but um, bacteria is um, the most frequently. Uh, it's the item that's one of the biggest pollutants in in South Carolina in our waterways, and a big, huge source of that bacterial pollution is really from our pet waste. Um, on average, uh, pets have a lot more, significantly a lot more of that harmful bacteria because we feed them things that aren't, you know, the native things that are out here. We feed them a diet that's very different than what, you know, wild animals are eating out in the wild, right? So if there are an estimated over 1,400,000 dogs in South Carolina, and the average dog produces about 0.75 pounds of waste per day, that's over... 1,067,000 pounds of dog waste in South Carolina every single day. And if it's not properly picked up and disposed of, that's a huge issue. Most of our stormwater drains, they're not going to a treatment facility. And that's just good to know anyway, to always like pick up any waste material, any kind of you know, debris that we see, um, because anything that we get a storm, a pop-up storm, and everything that can and will run into those stormwater drains does. And often that connects directly to our beautiful harbor and our estuaries and the areas that we like to fish and swim and recreate. So keeping these areas healthy for many different reasons is, is just so important. So ways that we can help is always pick up our dog waste every single time. And this even includes our own backyards, even those of us that might live on big properties and have a lot of space, we still really should, should do a little bit better and picking up our pet waste, always having bags on hand, and then always disposing it in the trash. And I would like to thank Clemson University for providing this. Um, and it's just good to, good to share this information, I think, for everybody. All right. Back to the fun stuff. Um, this is such a good one. One of the best parts of my job is that I get to collaborate with some incredible ecologists and naturalists and scientists. And um, one of my favorite stories involves um, Teresa Moody. Hopefully she is watching tonight. But we, years ago, came across this little beetle. Um, I believe it was at the seaweed shell ring, maybe the first time that I ever encountered this beetle, but the palmetto tortoise beetle. If you haven't met this beetle yet, now is your chance. This is an incredible little thing that the middle photo right here shows the larva of this beetle, okay? So the larva of this beetle might be a tasty snack to other things. However, I might be less of a tasty snack if I do a DIY hat that I make out of my own fecal matter. And that way I can weave this and make this great little hat and I've got this protective cover and then maybe things don't wanna eat me when I'm nice and soft and I'm not like a full fledged beetle yet. Um, 
So that is the story of the palmetto tortoise beetle. And I'm going to credit Tess with a little fun rhyme she came up with upon this finding. This is my fecal thatch. It's made from my scat. I wear it around as a tiny little hat. So much fun. Um, so you can see on the left there, that is what you would come across. You'll often find these, they're named appropriately palmetto tortoise beetle because the only time I've ever come across them has been on palmetto. And we are the palmetto state, so it's a great beetle to celebrate for our palmetto state. But the far left picture is what you would see usually on the underside of a palmetto, you know, frond. And that's the fecal thatch hat in all its glory. And then, of course, the middle picture is that it's actually upside down. We kind of plucked it off for a second just to, well, I didn't, but Tony, who was kind enough to let me use these images from Bug Guide. And then of course the adult on the far right there. And literally these are about the size of like a pencil tip eraser. They're very small beetles, super, super cool. And they have bright white giant feet. I didn't get a picture of their feet, but as the adult, they have these great, like looks like they're wearing big sneakers. And it's really, they're very cool. I'm a fan, you can tell. Um, all right, so. We're wrapping up here and I want everybody to know that it's, it's just really easy to find SCAT if you look for it. After doing this research, I'm like, I am lead a lot of walks throughout our county parks and I now am seeing, I already saw SCAT, but now I'm seeing it everywhere. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I kind of talk about birds, but there's SCAT and there's stuff and oh my gosh. So if you really just start looking for anything, right? Somebody starts to point something out and you're like, oh my gosh, now I see that all the time. I never realized that was there. It's just taking that kind of extra step, whether somebody helps you do that or you push yourself a little further to go out and look for these things. But I guarantee you, you walk out in your own backyard tomorrow and you'll be like, oh my gosh, there's all these cool mysteries out here. Um, and we mentioned, you know, just the, the communication. You know, a lot of animals are pretty prominent about where they leave their poop. So middle of trails, I see it a lot with the coyotes and the bobcats. So it's often, you know, you're not scouring and looking for it in deep, remote places. It's, it's very available in many cases. Um, there are great guidebooks and online sites that can tell you what scat you're likely to find in your area. I will um, pass this book around for a minute. Tish, if you don't mind, actually. Um, thank you so much. This is an incredible book. It's There's an insect version as well, but uh, mammal tracks and signs. And there's a whole two big chapters at the end on scat. Super exciting great photos, all sorts of good technical information about size and shape and all those good things. Um, so a book like that is a great reference for me, for all of us. As if I wasn't already excited enough that I was asked to give this presentation, um, the PBS series Nova, anybody tune in last week? Because the literal Nova last Wednesday, which is still available for streaming, I think for at least another week or two, or maybe you have the PBS passport, but Secrets in the Scat, I've already watched it twice. Um, it illuminates the role of poop in the health of ecosystems and how animals communicate. Um, Scott Burnett is kind of the, the gentleman in the, the main guy in the, in, the, in the documentary, and he's the scat man, and I would love to travel the world with him and learn more about scat. He's fascinating, and he's just a really kind of understandable gentleman. It's really incredible, but it highlights a lot of like what I talked about, how studying scat can actually save species from extinction, um, all while not invading the privacy of the animal. And the power in the poo is that it holds the secrets of this behavior for those that know how to look. Um, and there's an awesome uh, connective story about wombats and their cubic poo. One of the few animals that is known to cubic poo. It poops in cubes. And it turned out that they figured out that they have a two-week digestive process. You know, these are animals that live in very dry climates. So to get the most water, that they can. Um, they're basically squeezing their poo down their digestive tract with their different intestine linings, and that's how they end up pooping out a cubic poo out of a round hole, which is pretty fascinating. Um, so that's just a good poop story, I think. And there's a lot more. So if you didn't get enough tonight, 
you can tune in later or sometime this weekend and watch this for yourself. But I highly recommend it. Secrets in the Scat, PBS Nova. And I think that brings me back to, this is um, my email and my phone number. And I would love for anybody to send me their poo pictures. Uh, if you like, I can help identify them. Sometimes it's a little tough out of context. Like if somebody was to bring me scat, um, I often come into my um, desk at work and find some really interesting things on my desk. Uh, but it's always good to have reference points. Like where did it come from? What, what's the situation around there? Because just alone, it's a little, it can be a little tougher. Um, but I can be found throughout our county park system. I lead a lot of bird tours and different kind of nature programs. We've got a winter tree ID, I think, next week at Palmetto Islands. And just a lot of different um, opportunities to get out in the natural world at your Charleston County Parks. And you can find more online at our website, charlestoncountyparks.com. But I'd like to thank you so much for having me. And I welcome questions if there are any. And that's it. Thank you so much, Christina. I really enjoyed it this evening. I wouldn't be doing my poo diligence if I did not thank our musical guests. I do wanna say thank you to Thomas Thornton, um, the facility manager at Kaka Interpretive Center. <laughs> um, but we will open it up to questions to both our in-person audience and our virtual audience here. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand. I'll be over with a mic for that. What is the most interesting scat that you've come across? Ooh. I mean, since I just talked about the wombat, I'm still kind of fascinated by that whole process, but I haven't, I love the word wombat. I've never seen a wombat in person. I'd love to, um, but I can't say that because I haven't actually come across it, I guess. Uh, mm, that's a tough one. I I think I'm going to go back to otter just because that has been one I think that early on in my naturalist days I guess I I felt fairly comfortable being able to recognize it and identify it and it's such a cool thing when you know we don't get to see these animals that often so once again I think it it just it gives that understanding of these animals are out here living their lives eating breathing pooping doing their things and we sometimes get lucky to see them but most of the time it's it's not under our watchful eye so i'd say otter just because that is one that i feel like i early in my early days i really kind of got connected with and got to the point where i was able to comfortably go wow there's definitely a healthy otter population here because look at this otter latrine and it's being used throughout the years and it just provides that insight into the natural history of an animal that i don't get to see that often so, yeah, Perfect. I like that you mentioned otters again. Our otters have their specific area that they go to the bathroom as well and do their little poop dance. <laughs> yes, one of our virtual viewers, I'm kind of following up with that, was wondering what your first exposure to researching Scott or who you, who you first were exposed with. I love it. You know, I'm going to say I've always been probably fascinated by it because once again, going back to kind of childhood and that I was, you know, I'm an only child too. So that might say something, but <laughs> I spent a lot of time alone in the woods. And I, when you're alone in the woods with your own thoughts and your own self, you kind of just look for everything and anything to kind of get connected with. And I think um, probably rabbits too. Like I grew up with rabbits so they uh, oftentimes in the summer we're just out in the yard so probably coming across like our my own domestic rabbit kind of scat might have been an early kind of interest but it really wasn't officially until I got asked to do this talk that I totally dove into the scat rabbit hole um, and <laughs> have just been kind of a little fascinated just like any subject area it might seem dirty a little dull a little smelly 
but it's fascinating and you get into any kind of research and it opens up so many doors and so it answers some questions and then it raises other questions and it's just like any kind of natural history topic there's endless subject matter there's endless learning to be had so good question though thank you you mentioned about the dog poo obviously there's lots of it and that it's full of bacteria because of what they're eating. Is animal poo bad for the environment as well or not, or just the volume? How, how, what's the difference? That's a really good question. And I think that it has to do so much with the fact that they are eating something that is processed, that's, that's human made. Um, and it didn't grow in the area where it may end up. Whereas a wild animal is eating, hopefully, mostly, you know, like the native plant matter that's around. So like take the, the raccoon and the um, palmetto, for example, those dwarf palmettos, they have these awesome fruit spikes that come off and they've got these really heavy, um, wonderful fruits on them. And when the animal eats that and then poops it back out, that's part of, that was already part a plant that was part of the native ecosystem. So it's not going to be offensive to that area. Um, whereas the, you know, dog excrement is containing so much more of that bacteria and that, um, stuff that wasn't part of the system to begin with. So I think that's the major difference. Um, yeah. Good question. Very interesting. We have another question from a virtual viewer. They were asking if you can tell the age of an animal by its scat and um, what kind of chemicals would give this information. Oh my gosh, I love that question. I didn't really get into that enough. Um, I would like to think that you probably can and given that I guess at a base level, yes, because the chemicals, which I don't know exactly specifically the chemicals, but when you think about any kind of any kind of smell, there's a chemical, there's molecules, there's chemical molecules, and they are offered up. And animals that are able to, you know, kind of smell that and learn that get really um, kind of connected and understand. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I did. Can you go back one more time? Just yeah, they were wondering what kind of chemicals might help uh, indicate yes. the age. Okay, sorry, because I had a thought process and then I went another way. Um, that the it's the fertility aspect is what I was going to say. That like if if those scent molecules are giving off that that animal is fertile, then obviously there is an age component there. Like that's not going to be a young animal. Um, so, but exactly age, I don't know. I bet there are, and I bet the, you know there are scatology is a science and scat I, I, it's a it's a true science and it is one that there are scatologists and nova will show you the scatologists that probably do have more intricate knowledge and exactly that and some animals might be able to be told what you know what age they are um but i think at base level just that chemical and that like fertility would tell you that it's definitely an animal that's of reproductive age so that's super cool Excuse me. This isn't really a question, but last week I was watching a special on PBS on penguins and the penguins that live in the Arctic, they quite often lose where they are, lose location. But if they go in the air and they fly, they can track where they've been and where they're going based on the poop that they see the comparison of color of the, on the, all the white ice, tracks of the brown, which wow. I just thought was fascinating and a great lead into tonight's show for me. <laughs> That's incredible. I recently rewatched the March of the Penguins, which I hadn't watched in so many years. And if y'all haven't seen that in a while and you've seen it before or haven't ever seen it, you should watch it. It's incredible. But that, that's absolutely something that would be and those, some of those animals are undertaking some incredibly long journeys to get from, you know, their ice pack to, you know, to the open water. So following those trails are absolutely going to be key in the communication and the movement, the migration of those, of those birds. That's fascinating. So I have a very specific deer poop question. Okay. I love it. So Excellent. we see tons of the pellets all over the place. 
And occasionally we see the little tiles that look kind of like the sample. But sometimes we see it, we think, so tightly packed that it almost looks like a dog poop. And, or we look at it and go, wow, is that a dog that pooped in the middle of all the deer poops? So can you comment on whether deers can kind of be constipated or kind of, can it take that form as well? Absolutely. I love that question. And yes, for sure. So, and I've come across that exact same thing. So I think a combination of things here, um, just like us, we certainly don't always poop the same, right? It can be very different depending on what level of health we're at, or if we ate some extra greens with dinner or something, you really can end up with different poo. And then of course, if you're dehydrated, um, the lack of water, will affect the poo. And as I mentioned, even the same animals eating off the same prey item might end up eating different parts of that. So their poop is going to reflect differences in what they had available to them. Um, and that's fascinating because that tells us a lot about, once again, kind of the health of the animal um, and I bet those scatologists that are extremely versed in looking at scat over and over probably get really comfortable with knowing, oh yeah, this deer, you know, I certainly have come across a few scats where I'm like, oh, poor Tommy. Like that just was a tough one for whoever, whatever animal left that behind, you know, <laughs> we can all relate. Right. Um, so it's, uh, but absolutely. And then, uh, to comment on your kind of question about, well, was there a dog scat or was there something else? You know, these defecation stations, thanks, Laura, for that one. Um, but the defecation stations can end up becoming um, common areas, not just for one species. And it may even be that there's, you know, a common, you know, trailhead that's like three or four trails coming together and animals actually want to cover over the, the poo or the excrement of another animal. I um, actually read a really cool story about beavers and beavers that um, there was an account of a scatologist watching a beaver and this beaver came up out of the water and immediately looked angry and then went over to some scat and it was another beaver scat. And that beaver actually took the scat, kind of brushed it off back into the water. So it kind of got the other animal scat out of the way and then took a very large dump right on the spot where that <laughs> old scat was of the other animal. So it's just like, once again, that marking of territory. And that goes back to dominance too, because if you're like the main beaver, you, you're the big guy that's got all the, you know, all the territory in your hands, you're going to mark that. And you're going to let the other beavers know possibly by that scent marking or the scat that this is my territory and I don't want other beavers in the area. So you might end up with several different animals or even the same animal, but multiple weeks or even years of scat. So good question, I like it. Let's take just one or two more questions here. So you said that you had a rabbit when you were younger. Um, did you ever see him practicing, practicing coprophagy? And do you see other animals in the area doing that as well? And I'm going to guess that that is a word for eating your own scat. Say that again. Can you so, say, say that word again? Coprophagy. Is that eating your own poop? It is. Okay. Yes. I yes. figured. I guess. No, that's okay. That's okay. I love words. I love new science words too. So thank you. Um, yes, I was pretty horrified by that. And I was like, oh, that's interesting as that happens. Um, I am not aware of other animals that do that, but given that rabbits do, I'm going to guess that other animals do too. And I do know for sure in a little bit of the research that I did that there are plenty of animals out there that will eat the scat of other animals. Because once again, it's a undigested remains. There might be nutrients in there for, ha for the having, or especially with the seeds and things, once they're you know, kind of macerated and they're broken down a little bit more, it just might be a really easy meal to come across and enjoy. So yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. I love this question from one of our virtual viewers. Do animals reserve scat for territory marking purposes? And what do they do if they can't go? <laughs> oh, hmm. oh, I don't know. I would, I mean, constipation happens, right? And I know, I've, I've read that it happens in the natural, in the animal world in many cases. 
Um, but actually, I would think going back to that communication, it really all depends on the species and it depends on what their intentions are and if they're in a situation where they are wanting to mark a territory or to um, communicate something to the other animals in their own area. I think they would reserve that for, for that. Very cool. Any more questions in our in-person audience here? Do we have any more on the virtual? I had one last from the virtual. Awesome. Are bird pellets considered scat? Ah, so good question. And the, I, I just joked about this, but I did read that ornithologists do consider bird scat to be droppings as a technical term. So it isn't as appropriate to use scat when you're referring to bird excrement. It is better to say droppings. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Yeah. Awesome. And thank y'all. This was really uh, just a lot of fun. Um, I appreciate you listening to this dirty subject and dealing with me. And I'm much more comfortable usually outdoors in the woods. So I appreciate you kind of working with me here and I'm very thankful. So appreciate the aquarium too. Thanks, Laura. Thank you so much, Christina. I do have to say scat might not be my favorite topic, but it is a solid number too. <laughs> So we do have our uh, final Holland of the season coming up March 31st. Um, this will be an in-person only event. We are going to have four speakers. It is speed dating with scientists. So we are bringing back some of our past Holland speakers for a second date. So they will update us on their research. We have um, Turtle Survival Alliance coming, Clint Doak from Turtle Survival Alliance. Deborah Bidwell speaking about biomimicry, Kevin Mills, the president and CEO of the South Carolina Aquarium, talking about why zoos and aquariums matter, and Megan Gallipo, a dolphin research scientist, speaking to our dolphins that we see right here in Charleston. So that will be in person only with beer and wine and light bites as well on March 31st. So a little bit different event for that. But we hope to see you there. And thank you so much for coming this evening for this wonderful event. Thank you, Christina.